And uh, those of you who have been praying for us, I cannot tell you how much uh, we appreciate it. Um, it has been a very difficult time for my family. And as we speak, Karen is having an extremely difficult time. Even to the point where I would say to you, would you stand with me as my family? Let's just pray for a second. Lord, as, as we look at this message this morning, and just the wonderful, clear understanding of the fact that you are our hope, the fact that Christ came in the, at Christmas time in the form of a baby, the reality that you transformed our lives from spiritual death to spiritual life. But in times like this and the weight that we have felt all week, I'm just grateful for your working that through in our lives. Lord, we would ask that you would in a special way touch Karen this morning as she struggles with the loss of such a close and dear friend. Do it, we ask, in your precious name. And everyone said... Amen. Let me share with you where I wanted to go this morning and where we are going to go. I grew up like you did. There are Christmas songs that, for one reason or another, stick out to us. There's one that I latched on to this morning. Because in the book of Luke, the story of Jesus and the birth of the Christ child is written out so clearly. In the mid-1800s, there was a church in France who asked a poet in their town who wasn't even a believer. As a matter of fact, he's a bit of a hell raiser. But they asked him to read the second chapter of Luke and put it into a poem. And he did. And that poem became what you and I know of as the Christmas song, O Holy Night. It was written by a non-believer who really had no interest in religion whatsoever. I grew up in church every year hearing the same guy. He was very old then. He is non-existent now here on this planet. He would sing this song to our church. My mom played the organ and he sang, O Holy Night. It's etched in my memory, hearing him sing it. And he sung it in a unique way. He, he kind of, as he said the words, he pulled them together as one. When he would finish one word, his mouth would change and, and he would drift right into the second word. And it was just strange. The words were never very clear. I can remember being a young teenager saying to my mom and my dad, how come he sings so funny? And my mom looked at my dad. My dad looked at my mom and they smiled. And my mom said, he's trying to keep his false teeth in his mouth. <laughs> and I found out why he sang that song and every other song he sang so differently. And from that moment, every time he sang a song in our church, it was entertainment time in my brain. <laughs> my brain was working through all the things that were probably going on with his tongue and his cheeks and his mouth and how he was singing. But that song was etched in my mind. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It's the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. The thrill of hope. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to take your notes out, take your pen and underline the thrill of hope. The thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees. Hear the angels' voices, O night divine. 
a night when Christ was born. You and I have manger scenes, many of us in our home. We have several in our home and several more in the garage in boxes. And that manger scene paints a Christmas picture for us with Jesus and Mary and the baby in that little wooden thing. And there are animals laying there. And the shepherds are there and the three wise men are there. And while it creates a wonderful Christmas scene for us, it's really not very accurate. The wise men were not there till several years later. The shepherds came a bit afterwards, but Jesus and Mary and baby Jesus were certainly in that manger. It didn't have a wooden kind of a roof covering like our manger seems show. It it actually was a cave in the side of a mountain because the inn was right next to that mountain. And that cave was a place that was hollowed out for animals of those who were traveling mainly people would put their donkey there or whatever animal they had. And the magi, the wise men, we have three of them that we place in there. We don't know how many there were. Most Bible scholars think there were probably between seven and 24. But they brought three gifts. And so we place three magi, three wise men in there. Mary was a teenager, probably 13 or 14 giving childbirth, she and Joseph. And maybe there was some help there, but there were a few animals in there. And a little bit later, the shepherds nearby came on the scene. And they, Mary and Joseph, had just traveled about 120 miles. She was probably eight, nine months pregnant on a donkey, 120 miles. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. This phrase, a thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. It is as accurate today as it was then. It was a weary world then. Our culture, we live in a weary world. If you turn on CNN, MNBC, MSNBC, or maybe you turn any of them on, there's just crazy stuff going on. And we have financial struggles, and they had financial struggles in their day. And we have relationship struggles, and they had relationship struggles in their day. And there's tension in our culture, and there's tension in their culture. That thrill of hope, just maybe, there's always that hope. But when hope becomes reality, it's a thrill. But the children of Israel for centuries have been waiting for their Messiah, waiting for the one who was going to come and change everything from them, for them. And they thought that that he was going to come as a king, that he was going to change everything about them, that he was going to build the nation back again the way it ought to be. And they would find hope, and then they would rejoice. And even in the chaos of that night, the thrill of hope, That next morning, that glorious morning. See, they expected their their Messiah to to come in royalty, but he came in the form of a baby in the lowliest of settings, out by the animals in a barn in humility. And when we accept this humble child as our Savior. For us, it is a new and it is a glorious morning. Lamentations. I want to go there. (laughs) Merry Christmas. It's a book about lamenting. But the prophet Jeremiah in this passage talks about the fact that things just have been Not great. As a matter of fact, they have been horrible. 586 years before Christ is born, Jeremiah is writing this down. 
You see, Israel, uh, Israel fell as a nation about 586 years before Christ was born, and they were in bondage to another nation. Israel, over and over again, as you read through the Old Testament, Israel, as a nation, as God's chosen people, they're actually living their lives to honor God, or, or they, go, they, they go from that down into seasons where they, they just kind of walk away and don't even care about God. And they seem to do this over and over and over again. And, and they did it again in, in this time period. And, and Jerusalem fell as a nation. And, and the prophet Jeremiah writes that the people were distraught. They were at the end of their wits when he's writing this. And then, and then he has a moment of faith. It, it transitions right around verse 20 in chapter 3 of Lamentations. He's writing, he says, well, I well remember them. My soul was downcast within me. I was so discouraged, he says. And yet this I call to mind. He begins to think differently. And how many times have I said, well, the way we think controls the way we feel, which controls the way we act. And it plays out right here in Jeremiah's writing. I, 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 my, my soul is downcast within me, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. In other words, everything doesn't overtake us because of the Lord's great love. For his compassion never fail. His compassions never fail. How much God cares for you and for me never fails. It never withers. It never changes. No matter what we feel and what we're going through. Then he goes on to say they are new Every morning, when God created us and designed everything, somehow, see, we're talking about God who there's nothing he doesn't know. He knew that we would need a new day every morning. He knew that a part of our day needed to go to rest. He knew that a part of our day needed to go to work and a part of our day was when we needed to wake up and step into a brand new morning. They are new every morning. And then, th then it, it moves him. His thinking changes so much that it changes the way he feels and it changes what he actually is doing. And he actually starts talking to God. And he says, great is your faithfulness. He's acknowledging to God who he is and how great he is. He actually talks to God. And then he says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of of the Lord. For those of us who are crawlers of, followers of Christ, we know how amazing it is, how, how the reality of Jesus brings a new day to our lives. And there are three truths that I want to touch on quickly this morning about this thrill of hope. The weary world is in darkness, but, but there is this thrill of hope See, the birth of Jesus brings exactly what you need. Exactly what I need. And, and, and it's new every day. And, and, and it's not always what we want. See, sometimes what we want is not what we need. How many times in my life the thing that I wanted was the opposite of the thing that I needed? How many times the thing that I wanted actually took me in the wrong direction? He never gives us the things we want. He makes sure that he gives us the things that we need. And when he gives us the things that we want, it's because they happen to be things that we need. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, and therefore I 
will wait for him. That word portion. You see, Jeremiah is writing here from the Old Testament. He's talking about when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, and you know what God did? He promised that his children would have everything they needed. And what God did, and you can read through this in the Old Testament as they were going through the wilderness, what God did is he would provide for them however much food they needed for them. When they were going through the desert, he would provide whatever manna they needed, whatever bread they needed for that day. And he would do it every single day. And as you read through the history of the Old Testament, that is exactly what he did. And he did it over and over and over again, every single day, a daily portion. But if they tried to do what you and I would have probably tried, I know I would have, to not just get enough for today, but, but try to get more than enough for today. You know, so, so I had extra just in case God didn't do it tomorrow. If, if you tried to do that, it would actually spoil, the Bible said, and go bad. He gave enough for today, and it was new every day. And that is the very thing that God desires to do in your life and in my life every single day. And look, it's not just us. Jesus, it was the same. He said to his heavenly Father, give me my daily bread. The, the, the source that I need every day. Feed me every day. Take care of me every day. Because God's plan and God's desire was that we would come to him for, with this little spot of time and spend it with him each day. Every single day. Whatever I need for the day. We... We so often, in so many ways, want to skip past part of today. We start thinking about tomorrow. Now, this doesn't mean we shouldn't plan for the future. This doesn't mean we shouldn't, shouldn't take care of things off in the future and prepare for the future. But he's talking about our daily living. And without going through the things that we need to do today, we start thinking about well, what do I, I need to do tomorrow? And, and, and we don't live today because we step into tomorrow. And what you and I need to understand is that here's, here's what God is. God is actually in tomorrow waiting for you. We, we don't have to worry about tomorrow. He's got tomorrow under control. We lost a, a really close friend. One of the things he was really good at was, was taking the whole day. He was not afraid to use a full day. Whether it was work or having fun or spending it with people, he would, he would use the whole day and let tomorrow worry about itself. A new day brings strength. A new day brings God's power and presence into our lives. That's his desire. That's why he set this up on a day so that we, we day by day would grow closer and closer to him. So that we day by day would in our relationship give him a little bit more of our lives. Because, because he, de see, Jesus doesn't just want to be our friend. He does, but he doesn't just want to be our friend. He doesn't just want to be our ticket to heaven. He wants to be our Lord and Savior. Which means, he, this is scary. He wants to be in control of our lives. Now, we screw up with that control word. Because by control, what he wants, what he simply wants is for you and I to understand there's nothing he doesn't do, know. There's nothing he can't do. He created everything. He just wants us to recognize that and accept that as a part of the way we live. And that makes him the Lord 
of our lives. But, but we don't want, our natural inclination is to fight that. We just don't want to give that up. He gives us these, we think all of our packages come under the tree. When we give him this time every single day, he gives us little gifts every single day as he leads us. The second thing Jesus brings is he brings the hope to keep on going. The hope to keep on going. I've lost all of my grandparents, both of my parents. The pain inside of me this week was deeper. It hurt more. It was very different than the other pains. But I will tell you, as much as that hurts, there was never a time where I felt like God was not in control. There was never a time where I felt like God had slipped off the throne and maybe he was somewhere else. I, there, I, God is God. And, and it, it is, it is a, as followers of Christ, it is the anchor to our lives. There was not a doubt in my mind where Chris is. Chris is in heaven. Chris is with Jesus. He's giving basketball lessons to guys who don't even know what a basketball is. You got to know Chris. He, he, he got there ahead of me. The pain is here. It's not for him. He gives us the hope to keep on going. This, the thrill of hope, even a, a weary world, when it finds that thrill of hope, it rejoices. In Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. Are we seeking him? You know, it's said that we can live probably 40 days without food. Some of you could probably live more than that. Eight days without water and four minutes maybe without oxygen. But without hope, we cease really to exist immediately. We actually cease to exist. I don't know what you're hoping in. I, I've spent years of my life hoping in wrong things. The worst thing that ever happened to me in terms of investment is I bought a stock and it did really, really well. It more than doubled, and I sold it, and I did so well. The problem is, I thought that that's what was always going to happen. And every stock, no, no lie, every stock after that I bought didn't go this way. It went this way. If you wanted to know how to do it wrong, I could have shown you how to do it because I only knew how to do it wrong. And not only did it, they go like this, but, but here's, here's the problem with me owning a stock. It changed from me owning the stock to the stock owning me. Because I would go and I would buy a newspaper. This was back in the day. There were these things that they made. They printed them. They took a whole bunch of paper, right? And they printed a bunch of information in it and they actually sold it at places. Some of you have never seen these. They call them newspapers. And in the back of the newspaper was the whole section where you could find out about stocks. And, and I would do that on, on almost a daily basis to my discouragement. And, and I had hope in stocks. It never went well after that. Some of us hope in another person. Or some of us hoping on a, on a certain outcome in our lives. And, and if that happens, then, then things are going to be great. Or, or then things are going to be okay. Or, but, but because this didn't happen, then, then the outcome that we were looking for leaves us distraught. See, when we hope in the wrong places, we end up hopeless. And you know what happens then? It becomes a very weary world. And in different areas of our lives, this happens. That's why we need a Savior. That's why God sent His Son. He sent our Messiah. He came in the form of a baby. 
And to, to us followers of Christ, Paul in Hebrews chapter 10 writes, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised that hope is faithful. He's faithful. In other words, he will deliver. I, you know, I, I stop and I look back and in preparing for this message and going through what we've gone through this week, uh, there have been twists and turns for me. And at, at several points, I even thought, you know, I'm going to preach something else this Sunday. And I just kept coming back to this. And I started thinking about, you know, Karen and I have been here 20 years. And we came here from me being at a church, involved in a church for over 20 years in Virginia. And then I grew up in my dad's church before that, and that's, that's about 20 years. And so that's 60 years, and I'm 67, so there's seven more years sprinkled in there somewhere. I'm not even sure where. But I started thinking about people and families. And here's what, I'm, here's what I came up with. I've watched people, all three places, over the years... I've watched people let go of truth. I've watched people let go of hope. And I've watched people let go of God. I've watched people embrace in their lives, lives. I, I've watched fear control lives. Anxiety, stress, panic, doubt. It's painful to watch someone lose hope. It is painful. But I've seen it happen so many times. Individuals, whole families. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, Paul says unswervingly. Let's embrace it and never let go of it. Let, let's hang on to what a new day in Christ can bring as followers of Christ. When, when it's a dark night and it's a difficult time and I'm preaching to the choir here, hold on through the night. It may be dark for a while, but there is a new day is coming. There's a thrill of hope that presents a brand new and glorious morning. In a difficult time in my life that I had no idea how long it would last, ended up lasting almost 10 years. The thrill of hope, a new and glorious morning. The third thing I want you to write down is Jesus brings the help that you're looking for. He brings the help that you are looking for. In the painful needs of our lives, He is our Savior. We find ourselves in difficult situations. A difference a day with Christ can make. Jesus was with His friends. Their friend had died, Lazarus. Lazarus was in the tomb. And they're all around him, and, and Jesus tells them, roll the stone away. And the King James Version says, the response is, it's been over three days. He stinketh. Stinketh. And they listen, and they roll the stone away, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is all wrapped up in all the, these graves. He had to come out like this, you know. He was all tied up and wrapped up. But he comes walking out of a grave. He'd been in there three days. You know what the bummer is? Eventually, Lazarus had to die again. He had to go through that again. There's a woman, 12 years, 12 years, she had this issue of blood. You know what that meant? That meant she was in constant pain for 12 years, and she lived a life of humiliation. And she, she walked up behind Jesus and she touched the hem of his garment and she was instantly healed. It said she touched the hem. It doesn't say she touched the hemp. It says she touched the hem of his garment. Instantly healed. And Jesus, another time, walks up to the pool at Bethsaida 
And there's a whole bunch of people there with all kinds of illnesses, and they can't even move around. See, what happened at this pool on a regular basis, the Bible says the angel would touch the water, and as the ripples would go across the water, the first person into the water would be instantly healed. And over and over and over again, this happened. And Jesus walked up there, and he walks up to a guy who had been ill, lame, laying out flat for 38 years. And he asks him why he does it. And the, the guy just gave Jesus all the reasons that he couldn't. And Jesus just walked up to him and said, stand up, take up your mat, just roll it up, and walk. And he did. This very heart of God it, for them is the same heart that he has for us in the middle of our struggles. He, he desperately wants to say to you and I, take up your bed, roll it up, let's walk. Verse 26 in chapter 3, Lamentations, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It's almost like he's saying, You've got to wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. We don't want to do that. We, we, we just want to go ahead and we want him to get on board. We don't want to wait his timing. And in a weary world, we're, we're struggling with how we manage our money, with how our relationships are falling apart. And we're struggling with what's going on in our physical body. And in that night, Mary is in the manger She's just come 120 miles on a camel, and she's eight, nine months pregnant, and she has this baby. No epidural, no medicine, nothing. I'm sure she screamed. And in the middle of the darkest night, the Savior comes. And you got to know that next morning was a new and a glorious morning. And the shepherds came. And not only was this a brand new baby, but this was the Savior of the world. And that was getting out, and everybody knew it. And it's a reminder to us at Christmas time, because Jesus was born, the reality is you and I can have hope even when we're in the middle of a night. We can know that the creator of the universe is there and we, we, we are the apple of his eye because Jesus brings exactly what we need and he brings us the hope that we need to keep on going and he brings us the help that we're looking for. And because he was born into this world, there is a new and glorious morning. Friends, that's Christmas. That's the Christmas story. And we, see, the reality is, sometimes we don't think we need a Savior until we're in a difficult situation. The truth of the matter is, this is a fallen and a broken world. And God knew we needed a Savior. And that's why he gave us. And some, some of us are living a comfortable life, and we, 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 we're not even, we're following Christ. Everything's good, and that's great, but some of us in different areas of our lives, we're struggling. My, my family is struggling right now. We need his touch in our lives. What, is, what does this mean to you? I mean, are you in a dark season in some area of your life? Is Christmas a hard time? I, I was on a coaching session the morning after I received the news from Joe. And Joe asked if I would lead the session. And so a group of about 50 people online with me, and they were sharing their experiences with Chris and their love for Chris and his love for them and, and how he made each one of them feel special. And, and, and we, we were sharing uh, about each other, and, 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 and it, it was such a, a great time there. But even in that time, there's a guy that we know in that group, pro 
certainly older than me. He's a doctor, and he shared that Christmas time is a tough time for him because it was on Christmas Day that he watched his father take his own life. And then several other people mentioned the reason that Christmas was difficult for them, and then a second person shared that they watched. Their, actually, they didn't watch, but their father actually also took his own life on Christmas Day. See, Christmas for some people is a difficult time because of, because of not only things that happen in that season, but, but things that happen before that season. And, and that Christmas, that chair is empty again. And that pain resurfaces every year. Some of us may be having a hard time because we're starting to freak out because we're recognizing how much money we're putting on our credit cards. All kinds of reasons that we need a Savior. But you know what? God has provided Jesus. And he gave him to us on Christmas Day in the form of a baby. In a setting of absolute, complete humility. Not what anybody was expecting a Messiah to come in. But it's that humility. When we find that humility... And we find ourselves at the place where we can just be humble enough to say, you know what? I need a Savior. And it is obvious that it is this Jesus that God gave to us in the form of a baby. Interesting thing about the religions of the world. Jesus said, I am the way. Every other religion in the world, the leaders of every one of those religions all pointed to Jesus as a part of the way. Jesus is the only one who said, I am the only way. I'm going to listen to all of them because all of the other religions said he's a part of the way. And so that takes us all back to Jesus, and Jesus says to you and I, I am the only way to the Father. And God gave us this gift, church. And in difficult times in life, and in the wonderful times of life, we have a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. There's a part of me that wanted to share that story with you about the guy, Jim, who sang with his false teeth. And I was actually going to buy another set of teeth and just kind of fake it and pull them out and, ma and make you think I didn't have real teeth. God loves you so much loves me so much. And even in difficult times in our lives, he just wants to reveal himself to us. He wants us to come closer to him. He wants us to allow him into more of the rooms in our life. Some of us, the closets. Stand with me this morning. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for who you are. We trust you. We trust your process. We trust the fact that you're at work in our lives. We trust the fact that we don't know everything. But it is with excitement and grace that we trust that you do know everything. And that you are... You're not just our ticket to heaven, but you are our Lord and Savior. Let me just quickly, real quickly, if you're here this morning and you've never accepted this little baby Jesus, who, by the way, grew up to be a man who willingly laid his life down, was nailed to a cross for your sins and for my sins, 
and he willingly gave his life. And they put him in a tomb after they took him off a cross after he died. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. And church, that changed everything for everybody of all times. And if you've never accepted the gift of salvation from him, in other words, if you've never said, I believe that you paid the price for my sins, Jesus, and I want to accept your gift and allow you to be my Savior. You've never done that. You want to do it. I'm just asking you to do it. You just do it right there in your heart by believing. Believe that he is who he said that he was and believe that he wants to be a part of your life from this day forward right on into eternity. If you'd like to accept that gift, you're doing it right there in your heart, just slip your hand up, put it right back down, and let me know. Yeah, see that hand? Father, thank you so much. Oh, Lord, this is a, a wonderful day. A day that, that not only does one recognize and accept you as Lord and Savior, but a day that we celebrate as a church family, even in a difficult time, knowing that you are our God and that you are at work. Do it, we ask, in your precious and your holy name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen.